From the CPRI Knowledge Hub and CPRIHub.org, this is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today we dive into free preschool, increasingly offered in U.S. cities through a variety of unique funding mechanisms, including new property taxes and even, in one instance, a soda tax. I mean, we definitely think that it has transformed the ECE experience. PHL Pre-K is different because it provides high quality Pre-K with no income requirement, which will allow families who make too much for the other programs but not enough to privately pay, actually have access to high quality programs for their children as well. We look at two growing programs in Seattle and Philadelphia, where residents and researchers are reporting on the benefits of free, high quality Pre-K. In the evaluation, we focused on children's development in language, literacy, math, and in executive functions. We measured all those areas, and we did show that children did make gains on every area measured. That's right now on Research Minutes. Welcome to Research Minutes. I'm Keith Miller, and today I'm joined in the studio by Phil Serenides, Senior Researcher with CPRI here at Penn's Graduate School of Education. Hi, Phil. Hi, Keith. How are you? I'm good. So today we're discussing early childhood education and essentially trying to answer two questions. What does high quality pre-K look like and how can we make it more accessible? Those questions are now more important than ever as pre-K seems to be growing as a priority for officials from the community level to the state house and beyond. Yeah, we're continuing to see more and more evidence that shows how important early childhood experiences are for life. But as you said, in order for those experiences to be beneficial, they need to be high quality. And we are now seeing more programs and systems set up to support quality improvement and as they are expanding access. So we're having components of quality built into these programs, and we're seeing them now roll out and provide opportunities for more and more children and families. And across the country, we're seeing a variety of new approaches to do just that. One of the more prominent examples is in Seattle, where in 2014, residents took the rare step of voting to increase their own property taxes, not something you see every day in America, to the tune of $58 million in order to provide accessible, high-quality preschool services to city children. Yes, and that tax levy uh, was approved by a wide margin, which just shows the importance that people are putting on these types of opportunities for for young children. Um, We can also learn from the Seattle preschool program uh, what it looks like to take an effective program to scale. They've started small and their strategy has been effective. They built in components of quality, they built in standards for what that implementation needed to look like, and then they've uh, slowly but continuously expanded access Now that the city of Seattle has approved the continuation and expansion, they're in a great position to be able to reach more children with this program that's already showing great results. As they've uh, had increased quality over time, they've also been able to reach more more children and families. As you mentioned, uh, the Seattle Preschool Program, it began with a four-year demonstration in 2015 operating out of 14 classrooms. And by 2018, it had expanded to 48 classrooms and 13 family child care providers. Importantly, it also included an evaluation component and a team of researchers from the National Institute for Early Education Research, or NEAR, at Rutgers University and Cultivate Learning at the University of Washington have been studying program quality, enrollment demographics, and the progression of its students. They just recently released their year three report. And you had the opportunity to speak with NEAR Research co-director Milagros Nores about her findings. I did. And I think just like cities and states will want to take note of Seattle's preschool program, I think many researchers will be interested to see the methods and findings that are coming out from the work that she's doing there. Great. Um, So let's listen into that interview and see if we can find an answer to that first question of ours. What does high quality pre-K look like? I think what Seattle has that is very strong is it was it was carefully planned from the very beginning. It consider had strong considerations on learning goals, on the requirements on teacher education and training, and on the teacher assistance as well. 
It also specified very clearly class size and ratio and supports and professional development for all the staff, all of which are critical to build a high quality program. In addition, I think one thing that Seattle has that very few programs has, and in Central, we're finding more and more that it really is at the core of uh, sustaining these programs long term, is that it has salary equity for teachers in relation to what teachers earn in the K-12 system. And I think the last bit is that it includes a quality improvement system that is built with the idea that the programs need support and data to enhance quality year to year. Yes. And, you know, Seattle's preschool program is relatively new. It was established through a ballot initiative uh, four years ago. Recently, Seattle voters approved by a, a wide margin uh, a new tax levy to continue it and expand the program. Can you give us some perspective on who is enrolling in the program and how the city is planning to expand access? Yes, right. Uh, so, as you said, it started very small. They were very careful about that because they wanted to make sure that they were able to do quality as they were growing. So they started serving 234 children in 14 classrooms in its first year. And then by the third year, it was had expanded threefold. So they were serving 943 children in 48 classrooms, but also they engage family care providers, 13 of them by the third year. So um, I think that what was central, that growth was planned so that they could, first of all, pilot and show for the city so they can maintain funding long term. And the idea was really to show it as a proof in those first years whether they could execute on their promise. And that's how they got the support on the ballot to then expand. It will continue to expand at a similar rate. So, you know, maybe doubling sometimes year to year forward. And the idea is to really do so carefully and supporting the partners that they're engaging with through the process. Yes. And a, a real challenge for any program in the process of expanding is to maintain quality. A finding that stands out from the report is that quality actually improved in each year uh, as the program was expanding access. Um, and you also find that quality was consistent across classrooms. How did you determine that? To understand what happens in classrooms and what children experience day to day, we use something that are called observation protocols. What this really means is that somebody that is trained goes into the classrooms and then for two and a half hours to three hours, they observed all the type of interactions that happens, what children get engaged with, the types of things children have access to, how the day is structure, how it flows through the day from one activity to another, how children are engaged and so forth. We use two of these such observation tools because all of them have plus and minuses, so it's better to have a to have a stronger view. It's better to use more than one. So we use two of them in Seattle from the very beginning and every year since, and this is where we've seen the scores nicely improve year to year. So this idea of the continuous quality improvement that they have embedded is critical to be able to do this this way carefully and substantially year to year. This has been even stronger in things that are more related to child outcomes long term. So language, the conversations that occur, the activities that children get supported with and think of and the processes of thinking that happen with children, how the program is structured through the day and really how learning is overall supported and encouraged by the teachers. The two measures, which are, I mean, they're technical measures. One of them is called the Early Childhood Environmental Rating Scale, and the other one is called the Classroom Assessment Scoring System. But with both of them, we are able to then compare to other programs across different states and cities. And we've seen, you know, Seattle really get up there in, in terms of quality. Yes. Uh, just this past winter, a near report found that among pre-K programs in 40 large U.S. cities, uh, Seattle's preschool program actually had the highest quality. One of the only criticisms, in fact, is that SPP hasn't reached enough students. Do you share that assessment? Yeah, so I, the report that you mentioned really focuses on, on, on having all those strong components and then also access, the, the issue access. So Seattle didn't get a gold in that case, it got a silver. But the only reason why it, because it really didn't meet all the benchmarks for a strong system, it is because it's serving less than 30% of the four-year-olds. Having said this, it I mean, it has all the policies upon which an effective program can be built. And it is really building its programming in terms of quality. So it doesn't mean it's not going to get there in access. It's actually, I would say, it's in a really good 
position to get there. So particularly with the improvement that we've seen in quality year to year. So it is Seattle is one of the cities to watch forward. Yeah. And you had mentioned the connection to, to student outcomes. As your team notes, the, the Seattle preschool program now rivals some of the nation's most recognized programs, New York City's, San Antonio's, in terms of quality. But I'd be interested, and I think many listeners would be interested to know, how did that level of quality impact progression of students who are enrolled? Yes, and, and that's key because we really want quality to be associated with children's outcomes. So in, in the evaluation, we focused on children's development in language, literacy, math, and in executive functions. This last one is really the capacity of children to use short-term memory, their attention, and their capacity to inhibit uh, automatic responses. That's like Simon says, you know, when the person doesn't say Simon, you have control your hands from moving or whatever it is that the person said. So it's the same, that capacity to control those responses. So we measured all those areas and we did show that children did do make gains on every area measured, gains that are larger than they would have in relation to just increase of age. So that's the goal, you know, to increase more than the average population would do just by age. They also had increases larger than the previous year, which is central. So th- this means that th- those increases in quality are actually giving us what we want, which is an impact on children that are larger. And the other last piece that I think is central, because partly the, all of these systems are built with the idea of equity, is that we did find that the program produced larger gains in this academic year from the fall to the spring in children from minorities, low income or dual language learners. That's fantastic. In terms of um, continuous quality improvement, which you mentioned, there's very difficult to really help providers attain higher levels of quality. Are there specific aspects or, or practices that are driving these consistent improvements in observed quality? Yes, you're right. It is harder than it seems, and it is critical that systems do have from the very beginning this concept that is quality is not easy to do get. And I, if it was, all the systems would be number one. I mean, everybody would get a gold. But it does require to get there. It does require two things. Usually, we the programs have some requirements on how children have to get to enter into the system. But systems that produce quality are systems that include professional learning especially coaching also, which is central in the Seattle program, to support what is happening in classrooms. So to work directly with teachers, use the data that we're collecting, that we also collect in the study, and then work with them to improve over and over the different aspects that are weaknesses in their teaching and learning processes. And this idea of using data in this way with coaching, professional development, all through the integrated into the system is how you get to find the outcomes that you want. One of the things that I think is so exciting about your work is that the evaluation began at the same time as the the city preschool program, which meant that you really were able to um, begin with, with a partnership that would allow you to support both the evaluation as well as the preschool program. Can you talk about the partnership that you've had with others in the city of Seattle uh, and other research teams at, you know, throughout this work? Yes, I think the partnership is central. So we, our partnership is with the University of Washington, as well as with the Seattle Preschool Program. And the whole concept of having the assessment embedded from the very beginning has that purpose to really be able to see what's happening to so take the temperature in terms of the, if you think about the body, you know, test that all the indicators are in the right direction, but also to provide enough feedback so that the program can build its quality quality over time. So not just tell them, you know, how things are, but what seems to be driving some of the things in terms of weaknesses and strengths. And that supports the program over time. The the partnership has been fantastic. I mean, we really are are able to uh, make this a utilization-based kind of evaluation in which we're able to give the city everything that we can to support their planning, their progress, their partnerships, their thinking forward. And our other partner with the University of Washington have been critical in terms of having the access in the right individuals in the right place to uh, produce the evaluation. Yeah, in addition to being able to show the the quality and being able to show the impact, one of the things I really admire about this effort is how you've been able to provide useful data and information 
to not only the city of Seattle, but even to those coaches and others who are, are working to ensure that the program is high quality. Can you talk about the the partnerships you've had with with teachers or, or practitioners or coaches throughout this throughout this evaluation. So uh, this this has been critical to have uh, engaged the University of Washington, which has a, a strong experience on supporting directly uh, teachers. So the Cultural Learning uh, Center. And what is great about that is that as we did the evaluation, we there was a c- open communication among all partners. So how would the coaches of the system uh, be able to support better the teachers and what is the type of data that we should also be able to give them so they can go through this process. So it's not, you know, it's not the type of evaluation in which we collect some data and we build a report, but it's more the one that we figure out how to best communicate all at all levels from the coaching all the way to the system. We worked on finding ways to make that process be as strong as we can and, and fit the needs of everyone in the in the system. My last question, I'd be curious to know what you think the implications are here. What can policymakers, program managers, practitioners, or stakeholders learn from your findings on the Seattle Preschool Program? I think it's not a, a very different from what we learned from San Antonio or, or even New York. I mean, it is really that programs have to be intentionally planned, that the components for having quality have to be there from the get-go. So that you structure a system that will be able to be high quality, increase quality over time because you'll have the right components to support that process. And also then eventually get the results that you want for children. So it does require to have long-term impacts on children's development. High quality is only the result of careful planning and execution. It's not just building a program. It's thinking about every single component of it at the very beginning so that you don't have to fix them in the middle of the way. And then you have the right skeleton, the right muscles, the right everything to create the program that you want. And then it's about supporting the process more than anything else. Building a quality program and then scaling it up. Uh, That's fantastic. And this is fantastic work. I encourage listeners to read the full study and keep up with all the latest research on the Seattle Preschool Program at uh, nieer.org. Milagros Norris, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. My pleasure to feel. was NEAR Research Co-Director Milagros Nores speaking with CPRI's Phil Serenides about a program in Seattle that seems to be getting it right. And it would appear that voters share that assessment, as this past fall they voted overwhelmingly to approve the largest new education tax in city history, allocating $341 million to an expansion of the Seattle preschool program. In many cities, however, increasing property taxes may not be an option, and leaders often have to get creative when it comes to bringing in new revenue. Philadelphia did just that, and made national headlines in the process, when it became the first major American city to enact a so-called soda tax back in 2017. The tax, which was still a topic of debate as recently as the spring's primary elections, has nevertheless helped the city offer free, high-quality preschool classes to more than 4,000 students over the last two years. Mayor Jim Kenney hopes to eventually serve 5,500 students per year through the program, called PHL Pre-K. To help answer that second part of our question, how do we increase access to high-quality early childhood education, I recently spoke with PHL Pre-K Director of Operations, Shante Brown. Shante Brown, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. The same to you. Glad to be here. So today we're discussing two big questions regarding early childhood education. What does high quality pre-K look like and how can we make it more accessible? Philadelphia's program, PHL Pre-K, is clearly a response to both. Can you just describe what the vision was for the program and how it came to fruition? Sure. The vision for PHL Pre-K was to ensure access to high quality pre-K experiences. Um, This was a vision that was um, not just shared by our city leaders, but also by the people of Philadelphia as well. In 2015, Mayor Kinney made this his priority when he was running for office. And in that same year, um, the voters of Philadelphia actually approved overwhelmingly with an 80% vote, a ballot question that created the Philadelphia Commission on Universal Pre-K. Based on the recommendations from the commission, and the mayor's vision, the Mayor's Office of Education, or MOE, 
designed a program that would um, create new pre-K seats in existing child care centers um, here in Philadelphia. And that was just um, twofold. It would do two things um, at the same time. It would help families access free quality pre-K, but then it would also support centers to improve quality so that the families could benefit and the system would grow stronger as a whole. We actually, at the onset of the program, we targeted neighborhoods where children were more likely to have certain risk factors and where there was a limited supply of quality pre-K around the city. And we partnered with providers who were not only already quality, but those who were also committed to achieving quality and were ready to do the work to to get there. If there's a growing push right now toward publicly subsidized high quality pre-K in the U.S., similar to what you just described, with a number of programs being funded through, say, a property tax or a similar kind of levy, Philly, as it often is, was a little different. And PHL Pre-K is primarily funded by a soda tax, more accurately, a, a sweetened beverage tax that was implemented citywide a couple of years ago. It was hotly contested at the time, but now the city's really starting to see the results from that. So my question to you is, was it worth it? Do you think that that kind of funding has helped transform the city's approach to early childhood education? Great question. Anything we do on behalf of children and families will always be worth it. I mean, we definitely think that it has transformed the ECE experience just because research actually shows that having a quality pre-K experience gives children a strong academic success and helps prepare them for the routines and structures of school, the traditional school setting. And the city's investments has also had us think about how we approach early childhood here in the city. Philadelphia already has three programs that focus on pre-K, and that's Pre-K Counts Head Start. And then we have a subsidy program, which also funds pre-K. However, All of those three program streams directly rely on income. PHL Pre-K is different because it provides high quality pre-K with no income requirement, which will allow families who make too much for the other programs, but not enough to privately pay, actually have access to high quality programs for their children as well. So in the context of PHL Pre-K, what does high quality mean? Are there specific elements or services that set um, these programs apart? I'm glad you asked that question. We actually get that a lot. I actually just finished answering it right before we talked to you today. So when we talk about high quality, we are referring to Keystone Stars. And Keystone Stars is the Pennsylvania Quality Rating and Improvement System for both early and school age education programs. Um, And within this system, the highest rating a center can achieve is a star four. So an agency being a star three or four would be considered quality. And agencies that participate in this initiative are required to have state approved curriculum, um, follow the Keystone Stars standards or the state standards, and then participate in ongoing training and professional development um, while still seeking out um, ongoing resources and support for qualified staff. And you you addressed earlier the PHL pre-K programs don't have an income cap. Is it completely open access? Are there any other requirements that people might have to meet in order to enroll a child in a program? So the only requirement that we we have actually had or that we require is that all children be three or four by September 1st and are eligible for PHL pre-K. And we also ensure, we have to ensure that you actually live in the city of Philadelphia. So there are no other income requirements for participation in the program. You would just have to share that verifying information, you know, your address and your age information with the provider when you go to apply. Given all of this work and all the effort, um, not just with the funding mechanism, but with, you know, getting these programs up and running, I guess my question would be, how is it going? Do you think it's been worth the effort so far? I know the initiative is still relatively new, but do you have any results or signs that suggest the program is succeeding or meeting those goals? Sure, we absolutely do. The first one that we love to talk about is the work that we've done moving providers into quality. Close to 40 of our providers have improved their quality rating from a star one or two to a star three or four. So we've helped move them into a quality status. Our program also helped to create close to 280 new early childhood positions um, throughout the program. And our parent satisfaction rate is awesome. Our 2018 by the number, so as of December 2018, 99% of our families would recommend PHL Pre-K to other families throughout the city. 
So my last question then would be, what advice would you have for policymakers or early childhood leaders in maybe other states where they're considering or working to establish similar pre-K initiatives? What have you learned in your time with PHL Pre-K? Sure. Um, First, I, I think that planning and coordination are key. Various initiatives are most beneficial to children and families when program guidelines are clear and everyone is working together to offer the very best outcomes for children and families. One of the things that I think we've been um, making sure that we do really well is taking the time to listen to the people who count most. So, you know, you'll, you'll see us trying to connect with families, connecting with our providers and our teachers, and even taking time to, you know, show love and, and give some time to chat with little people. The children that are actually in the program, I think that's really important. And if they're trying to start a new pre-K initiative, it's important to be very flexible. You have to research and implement to figure out what works best for the program and not to be afraid of change because change will be needed um, and you might have to shift course and that's okay too. And then finally, there's a value to partnerships. Partners and stakeholders are vital. They promote outreach, they support programs, and they also help to improve quality around the city. And we're we're excited about being able to do that work. And I would just encourage others, if they're thinking about those pieces, to definitely think about the value of the partnerships. As a Philly resident, I can say that I've heard similar positive responses from people in my neighborhood and elsewhere about PHL pre-K programs. So hope that this continues to succeed and grow in the years ahead. Thank you so much for your time today, Shantae. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRE Knowledge Hub. For more episodes, or to subscribe to this series, visit us at cprehub.org. That's c-p-r-e-hub.org. To share thoughts on today's episode, or to suggest future topics, follow us on Twitter at cprehub.org.